I'm Mo Rocca, and I'm excited to announce season four of my podcast, Mobituaries. I've got a whole new bunch of stories to share with you about the most fascinating people and things who are no longer with us. From famous figures who died on the very same day to the things I wish would die, like buffets, all that and much more. Listen to Mobituaries with Mo Rocca wherever you get your podcasts. I've got kids, and that means it's always about them. But I need support, too. That's where Ollie comes in, with their delightful, hard-working gummies. My partner and I can actually get a good night's sleep, so we'll both stand a chance of managing our stress responses. Even when the kids are doing parkour in the living room, discover Ollie vitamins and supplements. These statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration. This product is not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Greetings one and all, Laszlo Montgomery with you once again, another day, another Yu. This is the Chinese Sayings Podcast, now available on this very China History Podcast feed. And now for something completely different, a Chinese saying that isn't from either the Zhou or Han Dynasty. Our story this time comes straight out of the Southern Song Dynasty, 1127 to 1279. And we could thank a literary figure of the day who hailed from Li Shui in Zhejiang province named Yu Wen Bao, who wrote a collection of essays from a work called Notes of a Clare Knight, Qing Ye Lu. Yu Wen Bao lived during the early 1200s, during the time of the long-reigning Song Emperor Li Zong. Scholars remember Yu Wen Bao for his style of Chinese prose called San Wen. He wrote about local incidents and figures of the day and often exposed the corruption or failings within the southern Song Dynasty government. During Yu Wen Bao's time, the Song Dynasty was already on its last legs, and after Emperor Li Zong's dismal performance as a ruler, reigning almost as long as the future do-nothing Ming Emperor Wan Li, the Song was easy meat for Kublai Khan's armies, who toppled the dynasty in 1279. And our saying is, Jin Shui Lo Tai, Four characters, as usual, standard for most all Chong Yu, especially the ones with four characters. So let's break it down and move on with the story. Jin Shui Lo Tai. Jin means to be close to or to approach, and Shui is water. Jin Shui, near the water. And a Lo Tai is a high building, a tower, pavilion, or a balcony. So strung together, these four characters mean near the water building or a building near the water. Easy enough, but what does this actually mean? Now, let's not waste precious time sitting around trying to guess what this might mean. Let's go straight to the story, which eh, you may or may not be pleased to know is quite short, and I'll have you on your way in no time. Top billing in this tale is the great Fan Chong Yen. Now, he's been mentioned a few times in past CHP episodes. He's right up there with all the greatest scholars and thinkers of China going back to the great sages' time. And during the Northern Song in the first half of the 11th century, he was the biggest name there was, besides the emperor, and had served in most of the key roles in government. Fan Zhongyan was good at spotting talent, and due to his own humble beginnings and modest circumstances, he took particular care to promote men who came from underprivileged backgrounds. During Fan's period of service as a prefect in Hangzhou, never did the government run smoother. So carefully had the officials been selected and placed in the most suitable position for each man. Fan Chongyan had a long line of protégés, all grateful for his sponsorship and for giving them a chance to prove themselves in the government bureaucracy. But there was one man named Su Lin who worked as a low-level official on the outskirts of Hangzhou in the suburbs, far from the center of action in the city. He was someone of ambition, and like most aspiring men of his type, he had high hopes to rise up in the bureaucracy. But time and again, whenever promotions were made and officials were reshuffled to other positions, well, he found himself passed over each and every time. Su Lin took one look at his situation and knew... His failure to rise had nothing to do with his abilities. The problem was, he was too far away from Fan Chongyan. Fan's office was located in the city center, a long distance from where Su Lin was serving. 
And if he had any hopes of going anywhere in the government, he had to find a way to move closer to where the decisions were made. And that was wherever Fan Zhong Yen was. One day, opportunity knocked. Like a bolt from the blue, Su Lin was summoned to Fan Zhong Yen's residence to deliver a report. And just like Salieri did for Mozart at Emperor Joseph II's palace when they met for the first time, Su Lin prepared something special for the occasion, and he composed a poem as a gift to Fan Zhong Yen, and it went, Jin Shui Lo Tai, Xian De Yue, Xiang Yang Hua Mu, Yi Wei Chun. And this translates to, The Waterside Pavilion is the first to catch the moonlight, and the buds closest to the sun are the first to bloom in spring. Now, a literary figure of Fan Chong Yen's caliber was quick to figure out the meaning of this poem and the message Su Lin was letting him know. And the message Su Lin was letting him know subtly through this poem and on this occasion. He used the term Jin Shui Lo Tai, the waterside pavilion. It was Jin Shui, nearer to the water. And in this poem... The sun was Fan Zhong Yen, and the Jin Shui Lo Tai is what Su Lin aspired to be, near to Fan Zhong Yen, so that his skills and proficiency would be noticed by the prefect. Without this Jin Shui Lo Tai, this waterside pavilion close to where the action was, Su Lin knew he'd never get any shine, and he'd forever be stuck serving, unnoticed, out in the sticks. So from this poem, Fan Zhong Yen was most impressed and admitted his error in passing over Su Lin for so long. And after this, Su Lin's career went nowhere but up. So when you want to express your frustration about being so far from the action in your career, whether your cubicle is too distant from the boss or you rarely get any face time with the one person who could make it or break it for you, you need to get yourself a Jin Shui Lo Tai. This Cheng Yu has a couple versions. You could use the tried and true four character version, Jin Shui Lo Tai, or you can add three more syllables and say, Jin Shui Lo Tai, Xian De Yue. The waterside pavilion is the first to catch the moonlight. It means if one is in an advantageous position, thanks to their closeness to the powers that be, then that person is most likely going to be the first one to obtain benefits from their proximity to the benefactor or boss. Sometimes you may get lucky and fortune will smile on you as a matter of course, but if you're the type who doesn't like to sit around and wait for things to happen, you may need to find yourself a waterside pavilion to move into in order to be the first to catch that moonlight that can come in the form of a raise, a promotion, special recognition, or even stock options. Who knows? Jin Shui Lo Tai, special advantages come to those in favorable positions. Once you're fortunate enough to obtain your own Jin Shui Lo Tai, then you too can use your proximity to the powerful to obtain some benefit. Okay, let's call it a night and gather our things once again with great fanfare. A shout out to Emma in the Teacup Cheng Yu Yan Zhou Zhongxin. Superb work on this one, Emma, as always. This here is Laszlo Montgomery wishing you all my very best and inviting you to come back again next time, if you please, for another exciting episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.